some of the things that you already think about when you're doing 1D modeling, but perhaps you're not thinking about um, for 2D modeling, and we'll, we'll try and get to some of those. So what are we going to talk about? We're going to talk about, well, what happens when we do hit the go button? Uh, what are uh, some of the computations that occur? We're going to talk about the computation options and tolerances. We'll talk about grid cell con uh, size considerations and how that affects our time step selection. All right, so uh, you guys by now should be, if you're in the 2D class, you should have used RAS before um, and you should have been running 1D models. The simulation window for the um, for simulating a 2D model is the exact same um, as a 1D unsteady flow model. Um, the one thing you'll notice if you look over here on the interface is that there's an additional option we've added recently for floodplain mapping. You don't ever need to turn that on. That's a new option for the CWMS, uh, real-time water management crew, when you have an existing plan and you want, at the end of the plan, uh, after you've run your analysis, you want um, inundation maps to be automatically generated. That's what that button is for. That requires you to go into RAS Mapper and actually set up all the stored maps that you anticipated computing. The other thing that is new compared to 1D modeling is this mapping output interval. This mapping output interval is important for how often you want to see the results over in RAS Mapper. Um, if you're looking at the rise and fall of a hydrograph and you have an output interval of six hours, you might completely miss the whole thing. Um, obviously, if you have a smaller um, output interval, you'll see more um, information. It'll also make your output file, the output.hdf5 file, much, much bigger depending on uh, your time step. So when you do hit the compute button, um, it's gonna go through, do its simulation, and it's gonna write information out to the HDF5 file for, uh, if you have a combined model with cross sections, it'll write water surface flow and velocity each cross section. If you have just a 2D model, it'll be writing out water surface um, elevations, the depth at the cell centers, and the velocity at the cell faces. And then over in RAS Mapper, we'll interpret that and, inter and interpolate the data in order to make a nice map. Uh, you still have the same sort of computation window that tells you when things are going um, going well or not going well. That blue bar indicates things are going well. Um, but there's also an additional geometry writer at the top. That uh, What that does is it goes through any of the 1D geometry and creates some geospatial information that we're gonna need for inundation mapping. We already talked about the interpolation surface and bank lines, um, that'll get generated for you. We'll talk about edge lines uh, later on when we talk about mapping. Um, then it's gonna go through and it's gonna do the, the 2D geometry preprocessor where it processes the hydraulic tables for all the cells and, and bases. Very similar to the 1D geometry preprocessor which uh, does the hydraulic tables for cross sections. Uh, once all the geometry has been pre-processed, then we're going to go through and do the unsteady flow simulation. And lastly, if you have a combined 1D, 2D model, then the post-processor will kick in and uh, generate the data for the uh, profile plot and the cross-section plot. The first thing that uh, we just worked on in that last workshop was after you've got your model kind of set up, one good thing to do is to go in and compute the uh, 2D hydraulic tables so you can get an idea for um, what faces are gonna look like, make sure you're getting the right conveyance, the right, um, and especially the right end values. That always, that's a key thing to make sure that you have the correct land cover data set selected for your your um, your geometry. So you can do that in RAS Mapper. If you just neglect to do that, decide you don't need to, it will automatically be done for you during the unsteady flow simulation. Okay. So um, computation uh, options and tolerances. So you can get to those, as uh, Alex showed in the previous presentation, through the options, computation options and tolerances menu item, or the quick way to get there is from the three ellipses. So this is how um, I tend to get there through that button. It'll take you into the uh, options and tolerances. And you'll see in this window, you'll always have a column on the left that says default. These are the default values that will be used 
unless you override them over in the for whatever 2d areas you have so i can quickly looking at this model i can see i only have one 2d area it's called or 2d flow area it's called bald eagle creek and as we scroll down here there's very little options that are different than the default options but we'll, we'll talk about each one of these as we go through so just know that there's a default column and that the things you want to use you have to actually set them per column per 2d flow area so the first items are all things you guys should already be familiar with <clears throat> these are all uh, tolerances that you should be comfortable with from your 1d unsteady flow modeling and should have understood how they're going to impact your 1d model so by default theta is always left to uh, a value of one, meaning we're going to use the derivatives from the current timeline to solve for the equations. It's a more stable, uh, provides a more stable solution to the answers. However, you lose a little bit of accuracy. Uh, if you set that down to 0.6, it'll use information from the previous timeline along with the current timeline for solving. We'll give you a little bit more accurate answers. Um, but not as stable. So by default, we have that value set to one. When do you go play with that? Do you do that right away? No, you do that near the end of your modeling experience. When you have a model that's stable, you think is running right, and now you wanna see the importance of ratcheting down uh, the theta um, value. Uh, we got theta for warm up. Then we have the water service tolerance. This is um, for the iteration scheme. We're estimating what we think the water service should be um, for the time step, then we solve the equations. And if our initial estimate is close to the final um, estimate, then we know we can stop iterating and move on to the next time step. We're gonna keep iterating up to the maximum number of iterations, which is set at 20 by default. If we ever get to the maximum of 20 iterations, then we're going to pick the best answer that we got along the way use that in the matrix, and then move on to the next time step. Now there is a new one in here, and that's why I've got it highlighted, and that's the volume tolerance. Because we're using a finite volume uh, scheme, when we look at the solution at the end of each time step, we look at the cell, and we have what we computed the volume to be. We also have the computed water surface. So we're gonna take the computed water surface, go into the elevation volume table, and make sure that that water service corresponds to the volume that we anticipate the cell should have. These are things that in general, I don't expect you to change very much. You might change theta and ratchet it down um, if you're using uh, at the end of your modeling experience to see if that impacts your model. But in general, when you're just getting going, you won't be messing with these tolerances. Okay, that brings us to the equation set. We had a whole presentation on the difference between when to select diffusion wave or use the full shallow water equations. Uh, by default, the um, diffusion wave equation is, is, is set. Why is the diffusion wave set? The diffusion wave uh, equation runs faster and it's more stable. And that's our primary goal when we're setting a model up, um, is we want, it to, we want it to run fast and we want it to run stable and get us a, a set of answers that we can start to begin to um, do some investigation as to how we can improve our model, where we should make our cell size smaller, where we we're clearly lacking uh, good data, and so on, and then refine the model as we go. If we choose uh, one of the shallow water equations in the next release of RAS, we now have two different versions. We have the original set, which is faster, and then we have a new uh, shallow water equation that's a more conservative form. It's more strict with the momentum and um, will give better answers. Where would you use this? This is typically like going to be for flume studies. Um, and Gary will show you on the, the last day of the class some lab results where essentially you're doing a dam break analysis and you're just trying to track the very, very front of the, um, the flood wave a little more closely. Um, and maybe at like a, at a hydraulic jump. Um, but in general, we found that, that the original shallower water equation solution um, that's faster is gonna give us good enough answers for most river hydraulic conditions. Uh, Alex talked about the initial uh, conditions uh, time in the last presentation, but we'll just review. Initial conditions time 
is how long do you want RAS to hold the initial condition for the model to warm up and get your channel wet? So if you're trying to do it, uh, some sort of detailed study for like a dam break, it's not really going to matter. It might a little bit um, because depending on the depth of the water, the uh, flood wave velocity travels faster in, in, in deeper water. Um, so it might make a difference. Um, the idea behind the initial conditions time is allow the model to warm up to the baseline conditions you expect to see. Um, if you expect a thousand CFS to be in a channel, um, you allow that thousand CFS to percolate through the channel before you open the gates, before the breach occurs, um, et cetera. And so this time is how long you're gonna run the model for, so four hours, and then the ramp up fraction is how long it's going to take of this four hours to get to that 1000 CFS. Where does that 1000 CFS come from? RAS is going to look at the first time step of every inflow hydrograph and get grab that flow. The ramp up fraction by default should be 0.1. We found it's been really stable and we can ramp it up really quickly. So in general, you should see this factor being 0.1 as the default. And then the ramp up uh, in the initial conditions time is going to be whatever you think it takes to get water through your system to the baseline conditions. If we're just doing a straight 1D model or we're doing a straight 2D model, it's easy to come up with a time step. But what happens in the case when we have this combined 1D, 2D model and we have these cross sections that we'll say they're spaced at about a thousand feet, but then we have this 2D area where we have our cell size um, our cell size is about 100 foot cells. How do we control the time step? Is the same time step that we would use in the main channel for the 1D model with our 1,000 foot spacing, the same time step we should use for the 2D model? So let's assume you guys know the answer is no, otherwise I wouldn't be asking. So in the chat, why don't you guys tell me if uh, I'm using a time step of um, 100 seconds in the main channel, what should my time step be in the 2D area if my cross section spacing is 1,000 feet, but my spacing in the 2D area is 100 feet? What do you guys think my time step should be? I'm looking and waiting. Uh, there we go, 10 seconds. Okay, good. Right, so the idea is if we expect to see the same velocities in the main channel as we see and let's say we're using um, 10 feet per second, and we expect to see the same velocities in the 2D area, we need to be able to reduce the time step to satisfy the current condition. We, that's where uh, this line number nine, number of time slices comes in. So it's going to allow us to take the main computation time step that we intended to use for the cross-section model, that was our original model, and then we can apply it to the 2D area. And notice you can set a different value for any 2D area you've got. So it doesn't matter what cell size you've got and how many 2D areas you have, you can slice up the time step accordingly. All right, so those are the main ones you're gonna use. There's another one that comes in handy sometimes called a boundary condition volume check. And the boundary condition volume check um, is handy when you're, you have a combined 1D, 2D model and you have a lateral structure um, connecting your two areas. So if you go back to this model, let's say we had a lateral structure connecting our cross sections with the 2D area. And we had a water surface that was overtopping the lateral structure. Well, the, the volume check looks and it says, okay, maybe the water surface is higher in the 2D area than the 1D model. The boundary check is gonna say, do I have enough water to pull over the lateral structure for the time step that I've got and with, without making the 2D area go dry. So it's a, am I gonna dry out my 2D area and pull too much water out of the system over the lateral structure type of check? That helps with some of the oscillations you can get when you have a water surface that puts a lot of water in and they say, oh, I have too much and then tries to put it back, but oh, it took too much. Um, it often will help stabilize uh, those type of computations. Okay, the next one that we should talk about is the number of cores. Uh, RAS is a multi, uses as, uh, as mul 
program so it can handle using multiple cores. And um, you can tell it, tell RAS how many cores you want to use. Now, if RAS is programmed to handle multiple cores, then most of the time you would think, I just want to use them all, right? And in general, that's probably going to be the right answer. This is one of those things where after you have your model up and running, uh, take and run a couple different alternatives where you, uh, you know, you try eight cores, you try four cores, and you try six cores, and you see which one, which one runs uh, the fastest. What we found is that in general, running more cores will speed up your model. Okay, so in general, more cores is better. Um, so here you can see a graph of uh, inverse computation time. So this is really, really fast six times faster with 16 cores than with one core. Okay, so if you look at this line, showing you the more cores we turned on, the faster things ran. But you can see here with these other lines, the model was running faster and faster and faster until you doubled the last little bit of cores and then it slowed down. Okay. Well, each one of these lines represents different models. Based on these lines, and maybe the description down on the bottom, what do you think uh, these lines indicate about the models that were being run? Anybody have any ideas? This is uh, an Ohio, Mississippi model. So it's a fairly large model. And then these two middle ones are relatively small data sets. And then this bottom one is an even smaller data set. So for this really, this data set is a really large um, watershed scale model that was a rain on grid model that had, let's say, a couple million cells or uh, uh, several hundred thousand cells. So with more, with a huge model, the more course is really helpful. But with a smaller model, more cores didn't really speed it up after we got past eight. And that's because it takes processing time and computing uh, power for us, for RAS to split up the information to send all the different cores and then get that information back, accumulate it, and then send it back off for the next time step or you know, however the, the computations are occurring. So the bus um, on the motherboard has to handle the moving the data around. And if the data set is really big, then it makes sense to break it up into bigger chunks and pass the data out, do the computations, and then assimilate it back together. If the data sets are really, really small, then breaking the problem up into a whole bunch of little problems takes more time than not breaking it up and just running it on fewer processors. Okay, so now, in general, I would suggest that more cores is going to be better for you. Um, you'll need to run it to test it. But when you start looking at these smaller models, now we're looking at um, this model might have taken four hours to run with eight cores or three and a half hours to run on 16 cores. I'm not sure if the math is right there. But the idea is we, we would have saved an hour or 30 minutes by adding more cores. We start looking at these smaller problems. The difference is, well, the model took 60 seconds to run versus 62 seconds to run. So yeah, it was a slowdown, but it wasn't anything perceptible, okay? So if you're running individual models um, and doing your analysis, probably turning on all, all the cores is the right way to do it. If you're doing Monte Carlo analysis with the watt, uh, where several minutes per run starts to add up, that's when you wanna optimize how many cores you're using when you're running RAS. And again, going to be very model dependent, machine dependent, and you're just going to have to do a little bit of testing after you have a model that's up and running. Our grid cell size is going to be based on the land surface features of the terrain. We want to represent the terrain as best we can. We're going to try and control how water moves through faces, and faces are going to be achieved based on how we lay out break lines and refinement regions. We also, so that's our first thing we're gonna think about. The second thing we're gonna think about is we're gonna think about water surface slope. 
how quickly is the water surface and velocities, how rapidly are they changing? If they're changing very rapidly, then we're going to want to have smaller cell sizes in those locations. If things are changing not very rapidly, very slowly, then we can get away with larger cell sizes because the water surface just isn't changing. We this is very analogous to 1D modeling. In steep reaches where things are changing rapidly, you might have water trying to go through critical depth. You need to have a lot of cross sections to capture that change in water surface and velocity. When we're doing modeling, we're going to always want to start with a large cell size and refine the model through iteration. So start with that quick and dirty model, get it up and running, and then start refining it in the locations that you seem to be having uh, either problems or in areas where you need to refine the model. But once you have a little bit of a picture, if you really know where the floodplain is, that's going to help you identify how you can break up your model and direct water where it should be going. And lastly, uh, just like in 1D, we had the analogy in 1D modeling, right? You had a, a model, you ran it, you wanted to see if your cross-section spacing was appropriate, you'd interpolate your cross-sections and rerun it. If the water surfaces varied very much, then you're like, okay, I need to refine my model in these areas. So, such is the case with a 2D model. You're always gonna run your model, um, get it up and running, having good results, and you say, okay, well, what if I double my cell size or half my cell size? Halving my cell size is going to greatly increase my runtime, but do I need to do that anyway? Uh, or can I get away with a little bit less refinement? So you're always going to have to test your cell size um, by running another plan or comparison. What time step are you going to select? Well, your time step is going to be based on the, firstly, it's going to be based on the equation set that you choose. Right now we have diffusion wave approximation or the full shallow water equations. And as Gary showed previously, what we're trying to do is approximate the friction slope, either with the full uh, shallow water equation, or if we use the diffusion wave approximation, then we're removing these two last terms, the acceleration uh, due to uh, the spatial acceleration and then the uh, temporal acceleration. So first, what equation set am I looking at? Uh, secondly, or maybe firstly, the time step is uh, we'll look at what what is the velocity of the water in the cells and what is the time step. Okay, so we're trying to satisfy the Cronk condition, and then how we're trying to satisfy the Cronk condition is going to be based on the equation set that we're using. So for the full shallow water equations, uh, experience has shown that we need to have a Cronk less than or equal to about three. If your current gets any bigger than three, you're going to have instability problems. For the diffusion wave approximation, we can get away with the current condition that's uh, a current number that's a little bit higher. Um, we'll, we'll still be able to, uh, the model will still be stable and the solution will still be valid. Okay, but um, for the full shallow water equations, we like to keep it, the current condition about around one. You're not gonna be able to do that everywhere, but you gotta you need to try and keep it below three everywhere. And then for a diffusion wave, try and keep the current condition around two. If it peaks up to around five every once in a while, you'll still probably get a good solution. Now, how can we uh, improve our modeling so that we don't have to come up with the perfect time step? Well, we've added the capability in RAS to have a variable time step capability. Um, reducing the time step will help improve accuracy in your model, um, but it will also Im increase computation times. So we, we're always hovering on that balance between I want the biggest time step possible so my model will run fast, but I still want to be accurate um, with my answers. So how do we do that? Well, we open the computation options and tolerances menu, and under the advanced time step control, you can choose whether you want to use a fixed time step, which is our basic our basic guy, or whether we want to use the, um, one of the advanced methods. The two advanced methods we have are to adjust the time step based on the current con uh, condition, or to put in time steps based on a series of uh, time series. Okay, so let's talk about each of those. To adjust the time step based on the current, RAS will actually monitor the current condition 
at all cells in all space. And so what it'll do is it'll go through and say, okay, what's the maximum current you're willing to live with? Okay, I'm willing to live with a current up to four. What's the minimum current I want to deal with? Okay, well, maybe it's about two. Um, what's the number of time steps that I'm going to keep? I'm going to... Uh, I'm going to keep, so if your time step is two seconds, but my current condition is below two, how long am I going to keep it there before I'm going to double that time step and allow it to go to four seconds? So here we've got a value of five. So it's going to evaluate five consecutive time steps. And if my current condition is satisfied for all five of those time steps, it'll say, great, I'm really stable. I'm going to try and increase my time step and run a little bit faster. Um, and then how many how many times are we going to allow you to either double the time step, go bigger, or reduce the time step and go smaller? That's shown here. So in this case, I'm using um, a base time step of one second. That's what I have in my main simulation window. I'm going to say I can double it twice, so I'm never going to be greater than a four second time step, and I'm ne and I'm going to be able to half it once, so it's never going to be less than a half of a second. Okay. Now, the one little tricky thing here is notice that I want a maximum current condition of four um, before I reduce, or it's, I'm not going to allow it to go any higher than that. And then I have a minimum current condition, current number of 1.95. Why is that not exactly a half? Well, if I was to make this exactly a half, then I would tend to find myself in a situation where if I hit that maximum current number, I would half it. I'd run five more time steps and say, oh, I need to flip it because I've been at two seconds for five time steps and it'll go up to four. Uh, the crown would be up at four. It'd run it for five time steps and it would keep flipping back and forth. And that's not really the stability that we're looking for. So we want to make sure that the minimum current number is less than half of the max, not exactly half. Now, when it comes to the mapping output interval, the um, the adaptive time step, so that's one of these time steps, one of these, whether it be a half or a second or four seconds, whatever time step RAS thinks you need based on its doubling or halving the time step, it always has to be an integer value of the mapping output because we're going to be, eventually we're going to be sending this out to an output file. So if my output interval is 10 seconds, any computation interval has to be a multiple has to be div uh, divisible into 10, okay? So here you can see we might have needed to uh, reduce the, the time step from whatever we're doing. 1.25 goes into 10, but um, let's see, what's one that would not? 1.5 would not work. So if I was at three seconds and I halved it to 1.5, 1.5 does not go cleanly into 10 seconds. So that would not work for a time step. The time steps that are used will be reported to you as they get changed along the way. So you'll know what time step is being used. So even though um, RAS might compute something and say, oh, 1.5 seconds is what the user wants, it'll say, uh, based on this number, I can't use that number. Uh, the last way to do it is a time series of advisors. Um, for general river hydraulics, we're not gonna be using this. This is uh, very specifically for um, sediment. Um, transport where uh, this is how we control how you want the time step function to change. Um, but here you've got a t a, like a series, uh, a time series um, where early on, you if your time series was a 60 second time series, you wanted to uh, divide the time step in half for this part of the time window. You wanted to use the full 120 seconds for the next part of the time window. Um, you want it to be two time steps for the next 30, uh, for the next several hours. And then this, at this, this is where the sediment concentration varies a whole bunch and maybe the hydrograph varies a whole bunch. So we want to reduce the time step by a factor of six. So this is what, this is how the, the divisors are in there. So essentially you're manually controlling what you want the time step to be um, throughout the entire simulation. From my perspective, I don't know why you would ever want to do this hydraulically when you can just ask RAS, compute something that makes sense and use it and leave it at that.